Amen. Thank you very much. It was beautiful. Revelation chapter 17. Again, we're in a parenthetical chapter where he concluded chapter 16, with his, which is right literally at the door of Jesus Christ stepping on the earth with his return to the earth after that seventh vial is released, the great earthquake, the hailstones hitting, Christ returns right then and there. But we're in chapter 17, we're getting some additional information about the Antichrist kingdom, his setup, the religious, the political, and the economic side from chapter 17 and chapter 18. We'll be looking at the destruction of that woman today as well as the the, the, the establishment really of his political, the government coming together that, that he is building during this time. But Revelation chapter 17, we finished off with verse number 6 uh, last week. Let's start at verse 7. We will finish the chapter um, today. We might be here till midnight, but we will finish the chapter today. Verse number 7. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit go in, and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was and is not, and yet is. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And there are seven kings. Um, five are fallen, one is, and the other is not, yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seventh, and goeth into perdition. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which hath received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. They have one mind, and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. They shall make war with the lamb, and the lamb shall overcome them, for he is the Lord of lords and king of kings. And they that are with him are, are called the chosen and faithful. And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest where the horse sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, uh, these shall hate the whore and shall make her desolate and naked and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree to give their kingdoms unto the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. <clears throat> Let's go ahead and pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we do love you. We thank you for your word. Lord, I ask for your blessing and your help today. Lord, I pray that you'd fill me with your spirit. I pray that you give wisdom and direction in this message. Lord, I pray we see the truth of your word. Please guide and direct, Lord. We certainly do need you and bless, Lord. I pray and ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> now, last week we looked at this woman that was called Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abominations of, uh, of the earth. We talked about really how this was the start of all the world religions. Um, we, we, we looked at this woman who had represented the religious system, if you will, that the Antichrist will set up. He's going to need this religious system right off the very bat. So we talked about that last week. Uh, we saw she represented really all the false religions of the world and how, how the Bible stresses how Babylon in particular has affected the entire world. We had to figure out how. How has Babylon affected the entire world? Uh, we know of the world empire back in Nebuchadnezzar's day, but however, that did not affect the entire world. It affected that known world in that area at that time, but really even the size of Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom was not necessarily all that great. It was great for that day, but nonetheless, it still has not affected all the world. So we went back and we looked when Babylon started with Genesis chapter 10, and the answer was there. That city was established through a kingdom by a man named Nimrod. Nimrod was a mighty hunter before the Lord. He was brash. He was bold. He was wise. He's really almost your first world dictator. He's really almost your first antichrist. He establishes the city of Babylon as well as other cities, but Babylon was the primary one. That was the basis of his kingdom. While he was there, he, he built a tower. Um, and we're familiar with that, the Tower of Babel. This tower was religious in nature. Um, this, this was about idolatry. This was about rebellion towards God. 
It, it, was, it was also, uh, it represented worship, not the true God, something against God. And the Lord went down, of course, he confounded the languages, and he spread the people across the earth. So now what you had for the first time going throughout the known world from, the, from Babylon was idolatry, was false religion. False religion has taken different forms now because of the different language groups that have been established. And so that is carried throughout the world. So now you have throughout the world the basic, the, the foundation down for idolatry and false religion to be born. And that's exactly what took place. And that is how Babylon has affected the entire world. So, so we dealt with that last week. That's primarily where we focused. And then now look at verse 18 and what it says about this woman here. That's what the, the very last verse. I'm going to cover this now. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. This is, of course, is dealing with Babylon. Again, I talked about this a little bit last week. I'm going to talk a little bit more about it now. Uh, um, this city that reigns over the kings of the earth. This capital city of the Antichrist. Now, again, the, the woman certainly represents the religious system that is set up. The worship that will be taking place. Uh, in the Antichrist kingdom. Now, many think the city that the Antichrist set up is Rome. I'll cover that a little bit more tonight as we look at this city that's mentioned here on Seven Hills, which is where a lot of people think that that is referring to Rome. Um, I, I do not. We'll, we'll cover why I don't think that is Rome tonight. But many think it is Rome. They say that it's sort of code because John did not want to mention Rome, so he uses the, he uses this, the, the town of Babylon. But throughout Scripture, even in the New Testament, they're not afraid to mention Rome. Um, it really doesn't quite make sense that that's why that it was code. Again, Revelation isn't revealing. It's not hiding things anymore. It's a revealing of things. And, and the Bible directly refers to Babylon. Even in John's time, that was still a viable city. That was a city that was, that was up and running. And so we have the Bible telling us directly about Rome, but we also know that in Isaiah chapter 13, chapter 14, Jeremiah 50, Jeremiah chapter 51, are prophecies concerning Babylon that have not yet been fulfilled. I'm going to quote, instead of going through those verses, I decided just to quote uh, one commentator and sums up what is talked about in these verses. He gives seven things that have not been fulfilled about Babylon. Let me read these. One, the destruction will take place in the time the stars and the sun are darkened, it says in Isaiah. Two, the city will become as desolate as Sodom and Gomorrah, burned completely with no remains whatsoever, according to Isaiah and Jeremiah. Three, it shall become desolate forever with neither man nor beast entering into it anymore. Uh, two prophets. Four, it will be a time of judgment, not only for Babylon, but for all the nations of the world. Uh, five, its destruction will be followed by universal rest and a permanent peace. Six, its destruction is directly associated with the casting of Lucifer into, Sheol, into, into hell, Isaiah 14. And seventh, Babylon's stones will never be used in future construction elsewhere. According to, these are all according to Old Testament prophecies. Whereas the present day ruins of Babylon have been frequently plundered and reused in later constructions. So again, it is very likely that the Antichrist will rebuild Babylon and have that for the capital that is there. But of course, what we're looking at in 17 isn't just dealing just with the city. We're looking at this woman who represented the, the religion that the Antichrist had established, this, this combining to get to a one-world religion. And the beast itself, we'll get very specific about the beast, what we're looking at today in today's message. So again... We talked about how the world will become very religious and how this woman who is very attractive to the world and they begin to commit fornication with her. That fornication is spiritually speaking. It means he's getting them to, to cause to worship something other than the true God. That's what's taking place by this woman. She is the, the mother of harlots. She is allowing the world to commit fornication. And again, the meaning is idolatry. Keep in mind, Satan has to have a way to unite the world. The rapture begins. There's going to be a seven-year peace treaty uh, um, sign. That's going to get into the book of Daniel at the conclusion of Daniel, 69 week, and the start of the 70th week. Also, when you get into Revelation, at the, at the start, at the releasing of the seventh seal, when you get into chapter 6 and 7. So Satan has the way to unite the world. I think he knows the best way to unite it so he can have power, let alone the worship that he ultimately ends. But to begin with, he can't get to the worship yet. He has to have a way to unite the world. And that is going to be through religion. That's not going to be economics. That's not going to be politics. He's going to be using both of those. But the fact is, the key will be religion to get one world underneath him. That'll be the key. It will not be the politics. It will not be economics. 
If he can get the people behind one religious system, that's going to be key to him gaining world power. I mean, just think about it here in a local church. We are all of different economic statuses, different cultures, and different backgrounds. Uh, we have some in the United States from, from, from the south, from the north, from the west, from the east. Yet what combines us is religion. It's what we believe about God. That, that's what unites us. It's not because of certain economic. It's not because, uh, I, mean, I mean, think about it. There are people here that suck things out of crayfish. Outside of religion, we would not be united with them. That would not happen. That is funny. You can laugh at that. So Satan has to have something to be able to unite the world. He needs something transcending uh, geography, history, uh, um, the physical. This woman that is talked about here is just what he uses. The religious system of Babylon that idolatry that the world has been affected with since Genesis chapter 10, that he is going to be with great skill combined. And he's going to use that to get himself power, to get the world behind him. Again, he knows the only way to build this empire is through religion. So he has this woman who represents the last world religious system that God is going to destroy right here in the middle of the tribulation, as we're going to see. So now the Bible takes us back to the beast that she is riding upon. And so let's, let's tie in. Let's get into this beast and then tie that into the destruction of this woman. Verses 7 and 8. It says, And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. The beast that thou sawest was and is not shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the, in the book of life, from the foundation of the world, when they beheld the beast that was and is not and yet is. So we have this description of the beast right here, where he comes from. Um, he lets them know, there's no reason to marvel. I'm going to let you know what is taking place. You don't have to wonder at this. He's, it's not going to be a secret. The beast is, is described here as one who was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. Again, verse 8 here has a, a lot of speculation as to who the Antichrist is. Some, some lead us to believe Judas Iscariot is it. I remember being taught that for the first time back in 1991-92. Uh, the guy who was teaching the taught it was Judas Iscariot. Uh, and there's, there, there's other guesses out there besides, besides Judas of, of who people try and make it out to be. But it, it certainly is not Judas Iscariot. It's not, some even make it out to be Nimrod, who we talked about last week, that Nimrod is going to be the Antichrist. It's not Nimrod. That's not who we're dealing with here. We have to remember Jesus Christ, he is the one to, with the keys to hell and death. All right. We have to understand when we're dealing with, and we'll get into the resurrection, that pseudo-resurrection of the Antichrist, which is key here, here in just a little bit. It's not going to be Judas Iscariot. It's not going to be Nimrod. They are dead and gone. The answer to this, though, does tell us in this verse exactly who this beast represents. That is the Antichrist. Let's go to Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13 and verse 1. We're going to tie this in with chapter 17. And we're going to see who this is talking about. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea. Notice where this beast is standing, by the way, in chapter 17, on the waters. Having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horn ten crowns, and upon his head the name of blasphemy. We're seeing the same beast. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet of that of a bear, and his mouth the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave his power and his seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And the world wondered after the beast, and they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? So here we have the Antichrist. That this beast here with one of the wounds, one of the, one of the heads wounded, the Antichrist, being killed, and then a pseudo-resurrection taking place. I don't think it was a Some commentators like to say that somehow the Lord allows a real resurrection here to take place, and that is possible. I believe it's somehow fake. I believe it's a pseudo-resurrection uh, um, that takes place right here, but I'm, I'm not sure. It's going to be one or the other, obviously. 
And so we have here, we take, when we tie this in with Revelation chapter 17, we realize who it is that we're dealing with, that the Antichrist is the one who was and is not, he was assassinated, and then existed again after the resurrection. That's who we're dealing with here, is the Antichrist and his political kingdom. The, imp- the emperor, if you will, and his empire. Again, this is speaking of his death. <clears throat> it is this event that changes everything for the Antichrist. It is a turning point in his power, in his political power, uh, um, his purpose almost in general. Think, he's already going to be one of the most popular men in the world. He's going to be a great political leader by this time, uh, amassing a a huge following. But then this assassination takes place, he is dead, and then all of a sudden he's raised back to life. Just think uh, of what power and influence that event is going to give him. Just like it says in Revelation, the people are going to be thinking, who can make, who's going to defeat this guy? They're going to believe that. Again, that takes place right at the three and a half years, the middle of Daniel's 70th week. Again, the Antichrist is going to come when we first see him come on the scene. He's riding a white horse, promising the peace, producing a false peace even, after that first seal is opened in chapter 6. He's going to conquer the world that way. The world is going to be pulled together economically, and right on the heels of that is going to be this great religious revival that the Antichrist and the false prophet are very much going to be a part of. That, that great whore being set up. He's going to be using this, again, to unite the world. This is all before the first three and a half years. This is what he's going to be using to help gain power. Again, so the beast here is the Antichrist, which will pull the world together. The Antichrist, we see him described in in many chapters in the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 7, chapter 8, chapter 9, chapter 11. He's described as a military mastermind, a man of great power. It describes him as an intellectual genius, a master orator, a master politician. Now, this resurrection will catapult him into another sphere altogether. Supernatural, if you will, now. That's how the world's going to view him. It's also at this time, as we're going to see when we conclude today's message, that he will now become very intolerant of his own religious system that he has set up. He no longer needs it. It's already served its purpose. And he will destroy it. And, of course, that is all according to God's will. It says, of course, in verse 8, how those whose names are not written in the Lamb's Book of Life, they're going to wonder at him. They're going to believe the deception that's taking place. Uh, it says, and they, sh- they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names are not written in the book of life. Those, those who know Christ, those who are converted, they're not going to be deceived by this. When they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. When they see all this transpire, they're, they're going to believe the lies. They're going to fall into that. Look over in Isaiah chapter 66. So we have here is this woman's right on the beast. We, we know that is the Antichrist. He, gains, uh, he has a great deal of power with his political and his military and his oratory skills. But then this resurrection takes place and it puts him at a whole other level. He's been using this religious system that him and the false prophet have been uh, using to unite the world to gain a following. We know the world's going to be deceived. They're going to believe the delusion. This is interesting here. It's scary. At the same time, Isaiah chapter 66, verse 3 and 4. He that killeth an ox as if he slew a man. He that sacrificeth a lamb as if he cut off a dog's neck. He that offereth an oblation as if he offered swine's blood. He that burneth incense as if he blessed an idol. Yea, they have chosen their own ways, and their soul delighteth in their abominations. Now look at the result of this. We see what's taking place in Revelation 17. I also will choose their delusions. God will choose what they believe. He's going to choose the lies that they accept when they see the Antichrist. He will choose their delusions and will bring their fears upon them because when I called, none did answer. When I spake, they did not hear, but they did evil before mine eyes and choose that which I delighted not. It's similar to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Turn over there, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Let's 
So as he is building this political and economic and religious powerhouse, the people are believing him. They're believing the delusion that is being put forth. Verse 10. Well, we can, verse 9, we can see it's dealing with the Antichrist, the establishment prior to this. Verse 9, even him who's coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not in the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. And by the way, please keep in mind, different than how I taught that section of verses for years, this is dealing with when the Antichrist is in power, not before when the rapture takes place. This is in the middle of it right here. <clears throat> so, he will deceive the lost. Those who do not know Christ, there is a mass deception that takes place. They're going to wonder at him. His end, of course, is perdition, as it says. It's simply another word for destruction. He will soon, as we're going to see, be cast into the bottomless pit, you know, into the lake of fire. Judgment is right around the corner. And so we know that we're dealing with the Antichrist, and as we come back to it, now we get to see the formation of his government. How does he do this? <clears throat> Verse number 9. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And there are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. But when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, of the seven, and goeth into perdition. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as, of, as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. Now let's stop there. That, that changes after that. It gets into their purpose in, chapter, in, in verse 14. So the, we, we have this beast, the Antichrist, here, and begin to see the formation of the government. We have seven heads on seven mountains, which are which were the woman sit tied right in with seven kings. Um, I, I think that's important. I believe that the seven mountains, even be, the seven mountains, even referring to the seven kings and their kingdom. And so let me try and tie all this together. Multitudes of commentators, of course, believe this verse is speaking of Rome, and I certainly understand why. In writings outside of Scripture, Rome is, is referred to as a city sitting on seven hills. Um, it's, it's in other writings, it's been that way for centuries. Uh, I mean, more than a thousand years, going back 2,000 years, that's been a reference. It's not that there's actually literally seven hills there, but I guess there's seven popular ones. And so it's, it's a reference to that. And because of the rise in the power of the Catholic Church, and knowing this is dealing with religion, you can see all the connections being made. I have no doubt that somehow that, that the Antichrist is going to be using the Roman Catholic Church. I mean, there, there's a billion followers. There's assets there. There's all kinds of things. But understand, there's also just as much money and influence and power within Muslim, within Buddhism, within Hinduism. He has to get all those things together. It's not just one entity there, and that's it. So I, I certainly think that's going to be a player. But I think that we have here is we have these, uh, we have, we, I think as, if we follow the chain, we see what's taking place here. We have these seven heads, which are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. We, we, when we take a look at the seven heads, which is referred to as seven mountains, and we tie it in even with Daniel, what we're dealing with. And then we get into verse 10, and there are seven kings. Five are fallen, one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. A lot of the reading here ties in all of those saying that the seven kings, the seven mountains, and are still, it's referring directly to them also as the seven kings, which fits with what we see in Daniel here in the book of Revelation with what's taking place. So the question is then, who in the world would these seven kings be? By the way, there, there are different places in the word of God. I do want to bring this up. I almost skipped this is there are different references in the Bible where it uses the word mountain or hill there to refer to a kingdom. We'll see it in Daniel chapter, I don't know if I'm reading or not, Daniel chapter 7, there's one, we get down to verse 34, 35, uh, and there's several other places where it refers to a, a nation, if you will, or a kingdom in regards to a mountain. So we have that, we already have that, that in Scripture taking place. 
<clears throat> so we have seven heads, which are seven mountains, which we have these seven kings. So who is all this? Why these three sevens? Especially if they're all the same, which I certainly believe they are. That it's not three unique, that it's three sevens. The seven heads are seven mountains and are seven kings. So who would these be? What, are, what is being described here? So we have these descriptions of these seven kings. Five are fa- uh, five have fallen, one is, and one has not yet come. Let's go over to Daniel chapter 2. I've dealt with this... <clears throat> Uh, A couple of months ago, we're going to touch on it again, a little bit more detail now, though, of what we're looking at here, of this seven. Because we have to know who these seven heads are. Because it deals directly with the Antichrist. I'm going to start in verse number 37. Daniel is interpreting the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had. He says, Thou, O, thou, o king, art a king of kings, uh, um, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of heaven hath he given into thine hand, and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. He's describing the, the dream, the statue. And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. And it goes on to deal with the toes, which, by the way, there's ten toes. We'll get into that here here in just a little bit. So now when we get into these kingdoms here, we have this vision of Nebuchadnezzar. Would you go ahead and show this slide now? Pull that up. Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And so what, what Daniel laid out for us, this was the image uh, of the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had, that Daniel had told him what it was and gave the interpretation of it. He said, listen, you're the head of gold. This is, this is, your, this is your empire right here. But after you, there's going to come a, a kingdom not quite as strong. That's going to be the Persians, the, Medo, the primary of the Persians. Uh, um, and, and, and their world empire will come after you. And then we have Alexander the Great with the Greeks who are going to come on the scene. Um, that's going to be the next world empire, followed by the Roman Empire, which was still in control when John was writing the book of Revelation. So you have one, two, three, and four I- empires directly. And then, of course, one that was coming, um, the new Roman Empire of ten kings. You had the ten toes, which we're going to see that coming here in the book of Revelation as well. This kingdom that was not, we still haven't come up to yet, um, but uh, no doubt it's right around the corner. So we have one, two, three, four, and five, but we have five. We we have seven heads here. We have seven. When we look at world history, there's two other world powers that were before uh, that were before Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon. That would be the Egyptians and the Syrians and the Assyrians. So that's your seven right there, and it, it fits perfectly with what John was saying. He had as he laid this all out. He said f- five have already been. They're already there, um, and. and you know, the, let me read through the verse here again. He said, there are seven kings, five are fallen. That's going to be your Egyptians, your Syrians, uh, the Babylonians, the Medes, uh, 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 the Medes and Persians. All these have gone by the wayside. One is the Greeks, of course, have fallen. And that's Rome, who is in control, as John is writing. And the other is not yet come. That is the Antichrist kingdom. That's going to be his, that he's establishing, that's talked about right here. So that, that's what we're dealing with right here. Is, is the different world powers. Now, it's interesting because we know throughout world history there's been different great powers in the world. There's been some in the Far East, from India and from China. And so uh, it, it's, uh, I, I need to touch base on that. And I, Morris had a lot to say on this. I want to quote from him. He talks about this. Um, because there, there were other great world powers, but none of them, though, had an effect on Israel. All right? Um, let me read this here. I'm going to do some quoting here from Morris right now. He says, though none of these imp- none of these empires ever actually world the whole globe. He's referring to Nebuchadnezzar's, the Egyptians, and the Assyrians. Each was the greatest kingdom of its time, particularly in reference to the land and the people of Israel. And these kingdoms' opposition to the proclamation of God's word and the accomplishment of His purpose in the world. These, of course, have not been the only kingdoms. 
uh, that have been at intimacy with God and his purpose. He, he, he lists others, such as uh, Syria, not Assyria, Syria, Edom, Moab, Midian, and many others. But none of these, he says, were empires of great size and influence. On the other hand, he writes, there were other great powerful empires in the ancient world, China and India, the Incas. But these had only peripheral contact with the word of God and the chosen people. There were only six kingdoms that met both criteria up to the time of Christ and the apostles in the history of the world. Only six. That's what we were just looking at. Furthermore, he says, all six of these were not only legitimate heirs of political Babel, but also of religious Babel as well. Babylon, Egypt, Assyria, Persia, Greece, and Rome were all strongholds of the world religion of pantheism, idolatry, polytheism. Thus, they appropriately are represented as six heads on the great beast that supports the harlot, which makes sense. Those are going to be your kings. Remember, we, we dealt with this before, that how the Antichrist, the seventh, when he comes, he's a combination of these. The fierceness of him, the power of him, he, he's greater than any of them. All right? His kingdom will be incredible because of what he's going to do and because really the world now at this time is, is greater in, in, known, uh, in, in a known uh, sense, you know, from the West and uh, the Americas and, and whatnot. Um, so it's interesting. So, but we have an interesting statement here. Think about what it says here. This one's kind of, it, it looks tough. It's not that, not that hard, though. And the beast that was and is not, all right, the Antichrist, his kingdom, even he is... Even he is the eighth and is of the seventh and goeth into perdition. So this is interesting here. So what it's saying is, right, the seventh one comes, but out of the seventh comes an eighth. So you have the seven heads. The last one is the Roman Empire. This is when, the, when, when, when everything begins. The rapture takes place. The Antichrist comes on the scene with this peace. He's gaining a world following. He comes in control. He's building his empire. The seventh is in place. But it changes at three and a half years. It becomes the eighth. After that resurrection, after that pseudo resurrection, it changes. Um, this is now this is now a, a a different man. This is now again almost getting into the supernatural, if you will. People believing that he is God. He is setting up his image in the very temple there in Israel. He he is the abominations that he commits. He sets himself up as God on earth now. That is the eighth. <clears throat> and now we have these ten kings as part of his government. It says, In the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beasts. So there are these kings that are going to rule a short time. Obviously, it's going to be a very short time. This is only a seven-year time frame that we're dealing with. That's, that, that's when they're going to have their power. And so these have the one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. So what are the ten here? What are we looking at that's taking place right now? These, of course, we know the horns represents power, authority, or strength. And they agree to give their power unto the beast and his kingdom. Even according to Daniel chapter 7, I was reading through there, basically three of them even have to be persuaded for whatever reason. Of the, this is also talked about in the book of Daniel. Three have to be persuaded. They're persuaded. They come in. And we know that God certainly was behind this. Look at, verse, look at verse number 17. For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. So they're going to make an agreement here to give their power unto the beast. So the final kingdom of the Antichrist, these ten horns, refer to ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom. They're not in power yet when John is writing this, of course. During the time of, they're going to receive their power during the time of Antichrist's reign. Um, there will be ten kings that are going to help him rule the earth. Um, even in Daniel's vision of the last one, you have the ten toes. Now, many believe that this will be a ten nation in Europe, uh, an economic, with the ec Europe, European Economic Union taking place. That certainly is possible. I have no idea. Uh, that, that very well might be it. In 1981, um, now I don't have great memory of this. I remember the after effects of it, though, because I started serving Christ in 1985, but there were still remnants of this. In 1981 was the first time this European Economic Union reached ten nations. Well, people want the rapture's here. We're done. 
we're here, this is it, we got 10, they were wrong, of course, I mean, it's fluctuated back and forth, so I don't know, I don't even know how, even know how many are right now, is there 12 in there right now, something like that, I don't know, I know it's not 10, but it's fluctuated, but when that hit 1981, all those in the prophecy were here, we got, we, we have it, that's the 10, I got news for you, it might not even be 10 of Europe, it, it doesn't have to be 10 of Europe, Another, there's an interesting, one fellow, he, it was his study and not mine. I, I was just reading what he studied. It makes it a lot easier on me. Um, he had listed several articles that had nothing to do with the book of Revelation prophecy. It just had to do with world domination. And it talked about the ease at looking at the globe and the current world structure, how it's convenient to break it up into ten sectors if you wanted to rule the world. Now that sounded interesting to me. I said, oh, I could see that. Because this is a world Thing. This is just isn't dealing just with Europe. I could see it just as easy, not necessarily being a European economic union. It certainly could. I have no problem with that. But I can see it just, I think it's just as likely that the world is broken up into 10 sections by the Antichrist, where he does assign a king to each of those sections who agree to give him power, and he controls the world from those 10 sections. That also makes a whole lot of sense to me. <clears throat> so that's what we're looking at here. Again, God is behind all this and them giving their, agreeing to give power and authority unto the Antichrist. It's amazing how often we forget about God's sovereignty and how much he is in control. I, I remember, and, and for, for some I took some heat. I, I didn't mind at all. I, I understood my point completely. I, I had no problem with it because I knew it was scriptural. I preached a message before the election last year, how God is in control. How all of us need to vote, but make no mistake about it, God controls the leadership of the world. It did not change our responsibility to vote. I believe it would have been wrong not to vote. I wasn't saying don't, don't vote, and I made that clear in the message. But make no mistake about it. World leadership, that's something of God. That's clear throughout Scripture. Just like here, like the delusion. Who allows that delusion to take place? God does. When these kings agree to give their power to say, you know what, you are, all are, it's yours. You have it. You know why? Because God said so. He's the one that put... Look in Acts chapter 4 concerning Jesus Christ. Acts chapter... It better be Acts chapter 4. If not, we'll go to it another time. <laughs> yeah. Acts chapter 4, verse 26. The kings of the earth stood up, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate and the Gentiles and the people of Israel were, were gathered together and were against him. They crucified him. For to do, the look at verse 28, though. For to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. In other words, all those events, as we already know, was under the sovereignty of God of what was taking place. The Lord was in control of what was happening, just like he is here in the end times. <clears throat> so, we have, whether, the, whether it's going to be a, an economic union in Europe that combines it, with this, and people, I can see that because of the revived Roman Empire, but I, I really lean towards the globe being divided into ten sectors and, and, and a king established and, and going under the Antichrist. <clears throat> That's how he's going to set up his government. Now look at verse number, let's go back to Revelation. I'm almost done here. We'll get through this last part very quickly. We'll be done by 9 o'clock, I promise. Maybe 9.30. No, just a few minutes, just a couple of minutes here. I, want, I, I do want to finish this, though. Verse 14, we have their mission. And this is a suicide mission. These shall make war with the Lamb. <laughs> That's just not smart. <laughs> They're going to make war with the Lamb. And the Lamb shall overcome them. No, notice why the Lamb's going to win this, of course. There's a colon there. For he is the Lord of lords and king of kings. And they that are with him are called the chosen and faithful. And this is referring, of course, what's going to take place in chapter 19. We know they make war at the land. You want to know why? Because you remember back, what did they believe? A lie. Remember, you had that meeting taking place between the false prophet, the, um, the Antichrist, Satan himself. And, and the lie went out from there to convince the kings of the earth to head to Armageddon, to head to the last 
battle. So their mission is the whole thing is going to culminate in what's going to take place when we get back to chapter 19 in battling against the Lord. I mean, Satan knows the end here. He knows what's taking place. There's just, there's really nothing else to do. You know, I don't know if he actually has any legitimate hope against this. I really don't know. But it, it, what else can he do but try one last fight to try and defeat Jesus Christ? All right. I, I think that's, you know, part of the deception there that will be taking place. So the mission is ultimately against the Lord Jesus Christ to defy him. We know that. Now, verse 15. Let's, let's finish up with this. What the Antichrist does is he destroys the harlot. He destroys the whore that, that has been sitting upon him, that he has been supporting up, that he has used to make himself look attractive to the world. <clears throat> it says in the 10, uh, verse 15, And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest where the whore sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. You better believe that this religious system that is set up, that this woman has made attractive, has gained a massive worldwide influence. Verse 16. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God hath put it in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree to give their kingdoms unto the beast and to the words of God shall be fulfilled. And this woman which thou seest, uh, sawest that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. Interesting here. We see the destruction now of this religious system, the destruction of the harlot, the destruction of the whore. Why? Why in the world is the anti- the, the very thing that almost helped him gain power, now he destroys. Well, it all goes back to that pseudo-resurrection that took place. The Antichrist no longer needs this religious system. Even the kings of the earth, these tender jealous over her power, over her influence, over, over the, even the, really the economic status that this is, this is going to take place. So there's a hatred here. The Antichrist and his kingdom can't stand the competition anymore. They don't need it. Because this religion itself has great power. It has seduct- a, very, a lot of seductive control over the people of the world. So he lists five ways here in which the Antichrist destroys this religious system that he established. One, she is detested. She's hated. In other words, after this resurrection of the Antichrist, that honeymoon is over with. He no longer has a need for this anymore. That is done. He's going to set himself up as God. So the Antichrist and his kingdom are going to turn against this system, against this whore. It says they're going to make her desolate. They're going to rob her of her wealth. They're going to take all the financial resources she had. They're going to pillage her. Next, she's going to be disgraced. He's laying out the exact process of what's going to take place during the seven years of how the Antichrist takes down this religious system that had united the world. He's going to make her naked, disgraced. There's no, no doubt there's going to be a campaign coming from the Antichrist and his kingdom to expose her, to show all the flaws. You can just imagine all the scandals that are going to be coming out and hitting across the world. It's going to cause much disgrace. After the disgrace, she's devoured. They eat her flesh. There's no mercy. There's no mercy here from it. Everything is devoured, devoured of this idolatrous system. Everything is gone. Everything is consumed. There's nothing of the former false religious system left. And if there was anything, it is destroyed. It is burnt with fire. Any bones that are left, anything there is burnt with fire so that it is completely and utterly destroyed. So really, what it began in Genesis chapter 10, that the Antichrist used this idolatrous system that it really had connected a great part of the world, that he used to establish this, this idolatry of all these false religions, now he no longer needs The world thinks he's divine. He now sets up again his own image. And what becomes law law in chapter 13? To worship who? The Antichrist. It becomes law. That's why you have this system destroyed. So that's, again, this is where the Antichrist, after three and a half years, will set up his image. The only religion allowed will be the worship of the image of the beast. That will then dominate the world. That's what we're seeing taking place here. So, again, the religious system of Babylon, with all the false religions that will be destroyed there by the three and a half years, shortly thereafter, and then the only thing left to be destroyed will be what the Antichrist establishes as the eighth, and that's going to be simply the worship of him, which is the direct worship of Satan. 
And that, of course, will be utterly destroyed upon the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, with heads bowed and eyes closed.